we can't pay our way to freedom, we should not be free. Because it's not going to happen any other way. That's the only way it's going to happen. We've got to pay for it with our money, our votes, and maybe even our blood. I think I've been talking long enough. I'm not through, but I've been talking long enough. No, you, you, uh, you really don't know what you're doing. You should, you should never say that to a Baptist. <laughs> no, that's, 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 really dang, that's really dangerous, I'll tell you. Especially to one, as I, who is descended from, I am descended from three generations of Baptist preachers, and if it is true the Baptists are long-winded, you, I could have a congenital infirmity. <laughs> Let me see if I can wrap up a couple of things. There's an awful lot to talk about, but I'd like to open for questions when this is over. I don't like to speak and not over for questions. Is that okay, Madam President? Okay. You put the president on the spot. You know, if she says no, she loses the next election. So. <laughs> We've got to come to grips with the reality of our lives. Whether we live in Mississippi or New York, California, Iowa, it doesn't matter. Black Americans are still economically at least at the most second-class citizens, politically still oppressed, and socially still greatly deprived. The black women in this room are five times more likely to be raped than the white women in this room. Black Americans are three times more likely to die than white Americans before the age of 35. Of all the black kids born in cities in America, in public hospitals, who reach the age of 16, 65% have never even seen a dentist. From 1970 to 1980, the median white family income went up. And listen to this. The median black family income did not go up at a slower rate, which would be a relative loss but actually went down, an absolute loss. We have 4,500 to 5,200 black elected officials, the latter figure being more correct. And I'm even hearing now some, some people in America saying, hold it, you know, you're all going too fast. And I understand that concern because, after all, we're almost 1% of all of America's elected officials. Almost 1% of all of America's elected officials. We've never, ever, ever elected an Afro-American governor of any state, although things are looking good in California for Tom Bradley. I don't want to spend more time on the litany. But I'll tell you this, we have a choice. We can choose to do something or we can choose to do nothing. If we choose to do nothing, we know we are doomed. If we choose to do something, we have a chance. No guarantee. White people don't even have guarantees in life. But we have a chance to make it. And if we don't choose to do something, then your children, 30 years from now, will be sitting in the same room talking about this same mess 
that we're talking about tonight. When we ought to be concentrating on trying to eliminate disease. How to harvest the nodules from the ocean floor to get our cobalt and manganese. How to forge new economic alliances with the younger developed nations of the world. How to eliminate illiteracy. How to build housing Americans can't afford. How to build safe cities and eliminate crime that plagues all of America but plagues black America to a disproportionate degree. Choice is ours. And yet we see some people simply get all they can, can all they can get, and then sit on their cans. <laughs> and there are some who are simply getting up. These are few. But we have so few we cannot afford any to be lost to us once they move up in power. Some get to be so big, they get to be so big, they get to be so big. They get to be so big that they get to be so big that they forget about the folks who made it possible for them to be so big. How do you stop that from happening? Discipline in the movement. When we produce a leader who becomes a crook, don't defend the crook. Take the crook out. He has betrayed himself, his family, and us. We produce a leader who betrays us, sells out. Remove them. Unelect them. Ignore them into oblivion. You know, white people who are interested in black leaders know who's got somebody following. Now, you find white folks interested in a black leader, all of a sudden the leader has nobody following. They'll drop that brother so fast it'll make his head swim. <laughs> or that sister. Now, I don't pro propose uh, uh, to suggest to you that I have covered all the bases. It's too big a problem to do in just a speech, but I do want to urge you to take seriously what I'm saying. If you don't know where to start, start at home. Find out if, first of all, if you are registered to vote, are your parents your sisters, your uncles, your aunts, your cousins. And then go to the house next door and find out the same thing there. And then the house on that side. If you live in a dormitory, start in your room and then work the floor. Then the dormitory. Then the campus. If everybody does his or her part, we can make it. Got to use our own money to get there. Let us not be crazy enough to reject white friends who want to help. But let us remind all friends that allies ought to be relied on for support, not for leadership. We can lead ourselves. Albert Camus, the uh, great French philosopher, talked about how absurd life seems to be. He said, we keep on getting ready for something, and when we have achieved the greatest amount of wisdom and wealth, we die. So Camus asked, if the only thing waiting for us down the road someday is death, why even bother to live? What makes life not absurd? And Camus suggested that at least two things redeem life and help life to make sense. One is love, and the other is change. 
As compelling as the concept of love is, the concept of change, to me, is equally compelling. Besides, I'm not sure which of the Greek classifications of love he had in mind. I think I was cutting philosophy that day. But change, what kind of change? I think the come you had in mind what Guthrie and Diller define as an obstinate daily revolt against the ordinariness of our lives. An obstinate daily revolt against the ordinariness of our lives. Black, brown, or white, everybody needs to engage in that kind of change to help our lives make sense and not be absurd. But when you're down and you know you're down and you're trying to get up and nobody's going to help you to get up if you don't help yourselves to get up, then we have even more reason than normal to engage in an obstinate, daily revolt against the ordinariness of our lives. More reason to go and study harder, to try to be the best, to live by a code of ethics, to use the power we have for good, for right, for better. And to remember what it used to be like. Put those together and add to that, you know, stir in a little dash of this and a dash of that. Better throw in a whole big heaping tablespoon of will. Because it will never be like that. It's going to be like that. Downs and ups. What's going to pick us up when we get down? How did our mothers and fathers make it? How did they come through the only slave that even to die the slave was human? Lynchings, castration, denial of the right to vote. How do our mothers and fathers in South Carolina today even put up with Strom Thurmond? Or in North Carolina put up with Jesse Helms when they tried to kill the only bill that has ever protected our right to vote, the Voting Rights Act of 1965. What makes somebody get up when we're constantly getting knocked down? To keep on keeping on. To do what others don't. Never to say die. I believe there's a characteristic about Afro-Americans that other people may have, but I know we've got. And it's called will. And I believe Ella Wheeler Wilcox best defined it when she said, There is no chance to know destiny, no fate can circumvent or hinder or control the firm resolve of a determined soul. Gifts count for nothing. It is will alone that is great, and all things will fall before it sooner or late. What mighty force can stay? the sea-seeking river in its course, or turn the ascending orb of day into night. Each well-born soul must win what it deserves. Let the fool prate of luck. The fortunate is he or she whose earnest purpose never swerves, whose every action or inaction serves the one great aim. And even death will stand still and wait an hour and sometimes more on such a will. We have it. We have it. We've got to use it. Questions? Yes, sir.
I'll repeat the question. <coughs> Uh, the question is that, I want to put it like you put it, that the bureaucracy, even though in a representative government uh, we have the elected leaders, the bureaucr bureaucracies deceive us, uh, don't reveal the truth, and how do we stop that kind of activity and find out what we need to know before it is too late? Is that a fairly accurate uh, reflection of the question? Okay. First of all, not all bureaucracies are that way. Some are. My experience is the majority of bureaucrats are plotting, dedicated, often underpaid people who get a job done. But there are those we hear more about in certain branches of government, sometimes state, sometimes local, but very often on the federal level, that don't reveal what ought to be revealed in terms of the truth to the people in this country. The answer is that the elected leaders, even though it is difficult to control bureaucracies, nevertheless have that responsibility. A strong leader will not tolerate that, will put into place the kinds of policies to avoid that, will punish those who break those policies, and the word will get down very quickly. For example, the year before I was elected mayor, 22 civilians were killed by police in Atlanta. And today, I, dare, I, I challenge you to go back over the last two years and find even the allegation of police brutality in Atlanta. And it didn't take us long. It took us about a year and a half to take care of business. We put into place a rule. Number one, we did not automatically assume that if somebody alleged a police officer had abused him, that it was true. That officer has a right to have a fair investigation. If the facts were not with, did not support the, uh, the claim of the citizen, we did not punish the officer. And we didn't jump to any conclusions and give a whole lot of rhetoric. But if the facts did support that claim, the officer was gone. No second chance ever. Never to be rehired. And we sought to have them indicted. Now, that policy sounds harsh, but it's necessary. It is necessary for the good of the police as well as the people. The police, to succeed in their work, must have the support of and respect of the people. And abused people will not respect the police. The people need to have the respect and support of the police. So what happened? Two and a half years into my first, my first term as mayor, a neighborhood that had engaged in a near riot a few years before held a banquet honoring the police. In a black, low-income neighborhood, 500 people showed up and paid their own way to honor the police. Now my point is, I can only speak from my own experience. I, a lot of people say it will never work. It will work. You just have to have, I think the speed of the boss is the speed of the crew. So my quick answer to your, to your question is, we need to elect toward each other and toward black society as a whole. Is that correct? Uh, I am. I belong to Alpha Phi Alpha. Joined the second semester of my senior year at Morehouse in the spring of 1956. And I joined it because I most admired on that campus uh, the guys who were in, in Alpha. But I went in with my eyes wide open because there were three or four other brothers in there who felt the same as I did, which was that here's an opportunity to influence an organization with a nationwide base 
to do more meaningful things. And that's still my view. Now, fraternities and sororities, if they're just going to be party, 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 the pop culture and all that kind of thing, are fundamentally exclusive. They are not inclusive. So there is a potential for abuse, especially among black people. And we kind of set ourselves off. The fact is that the talented 10th is represented in this room tonight. And all across the nation, folks who didn't get an education want you to be educated. Want you to succeed but also want you, when you succeed, to use that success, that power, that knowledge for the benefit of our people as a whole. That's our challenge. And that's why I'm going to, you all don't shoot me, but I'm going to say it like I see it. I think Delta Sigma Theta, hands down, has got the best program in the nation among fraternities and sororities. <laughs> but, but others... I don't mean I've even offended my own fraternity. But among the frats and the sororities, that's been my view now for a number of years. But that's a challenge to us. And sure enough, I see us coming along. Alpha, for example, is raising a million dollars to give in three equal parts to the Urban League, the UNCF, and the NAACP. We're going to raise that money under President Ozell Sutton, who's from Atlanta, of course. <laughs> Native of Arkansas, of course. But, uh, so that's, uh, my feeling is we need to use that power and not try to fashion our frats and our sororities after other frats and sororities. Yeah. <clears throat> <clears throat> Especially not after that fraternity on the campus of the University of Cincinnati. which I think has a chapter at Iowa State. A white fraternity that on Martin Luther King's birthday had the most insulting, racist um, skits and speeches and slurs. They've now been suspended for two years. Black students on the campus want them put off forever. But well, the responsible thing would be for the national fraternity to punish that chapter. And you all should ask it to do that. Well, see, I'm not, I think I know the name, but I'm not 100% certain, so I won't say. But you can check it out. Just call the BSU at University of Cincinnati. Find out. Our network needs to work, it needs to get busy. We've got more influence than we think we have, and we don't use enough of it. Do I see a hand over here? Yes, sir. Against the wall. <clears throat> sure. Okay. Okay. On the uh, government student loan program, Reagan has recommended to the Congress that it be cut severely in four categories. I can't name them all. Maybe five. Um, it is predicted by Dr. Hugh Gloucester of Morehouse College, the president, by Dr. Elias Blake of Clark College, president there, Dr. Cleveland Denard of AU, Atlanta University, and, and many others, that if that happens, one-third of the students in the traditionally black United Negro College Fund colleges, and a number 42, won't be able to go to school. 33 and a third percent. 
But it's not just black students, it's all students. Especially on the, uni on the, on the graduate level, especially there. Now what can be done about it was your question. The answer is to use our political clout to send the message not to the White House. No, we should send it there too. Send it there. But our better hope for support will be in the U.S. Congress. Now those ladies and gentlemen want to be reelected. They are running this fall. Started in this room, in this organization, a nationwide movement. It's probably already started somewhere. A letter writing all the students, write your Congress members. I guarantee you that it might even be increased. Now, there have been abuses in the program. People not repaying their loans. And that should not be tolerated. As a matter of fact, David Stockman did not repay his loan until 14 years later. Just before he decided to run for office. Did you know that? Holier than thou. 14 years in arrears on his student loan repayment. Well, number two, yes, letters count. I don't care how many comedians crack jokes about, write us and send letters to your Congress members and all that. You ought to write everybody who represents you. First of all, you ought to know who represents you. You ought to write them down on a card and carry it in your wallet or your purse. <clears throat> your council member, your mayor, your school board member, your county commissioner, your state representative, your state senator, and your governor. Your congress member, your senators, and the president. With addresses and phone numbers. You ought to have that somewhere where you live. For quick reference, those people make decisions every day. That influence how we live. That's important business. And yes, write them. Those letters are read. They are counted. They are tallied. And they are influential. Let me tell you what happens when you don't write. When you don't write, the Congress members will say, I haven't heard a word. So obviously, they don't object. Yes, sir. I think the best thing we can do is set an example ourselves. <clears throat> think positively. Work aggressively. We have to be understanding of each other, too. Put our arms around each other. Encourage each other. When somebody's down, don't laugh at them. Help them out. I think we need to be better informed and, and to become better students. It's not going to be enough just to be black when one graduates. I'm sorry. Black folks won't even feel it's enough just to be black. Because in the black community, being black is not unique. <laughs> the Africans made that very clear to us when they escaped the heel of colonialism. A lot of Afro-Americans wanted to kind of go to Africa. The first thing they said, hold it, you know, what are you coming over here with? Well, I want to come and be invited, but you know, what, what skills do you have? What talents do you have? What can you do to help us underdeveloped African nations do something and rebuild and or build a new rather. Well the African nation in America wants to know the same things from us. A lot of sacrifices send us to school. A lot of sacrifice. Even among those who don't know it, sometimes the parents and you think they're everything's cool and they're, you know, money's not a problem. Sometimes daddy and mama have already gone to the bank and just didn't tell you about it, to borrow money. If you see somebody getting a second or third job and they may tell you, well, we think about a new car, a new house, it may be to pay your tuition. So we have an obligation to do the best we can, not the least we can, to pursue excellence aggressively, clasp it, yearn for it, nurture it, and use it constructively.
and ethically for ourselves and our people. I think we have time for one more question. Yes, ma'am. Uh, maybe you know something that I don't know, and I would assume that you do because you've been working at this for uh, several years. I, I, I would be shocked if any black student on a black campus would have any bad feelings about what you're doing on white campuses. If anything, it would be a great deal of sympathy and condolences uh, coming from the black students on the black campuses, you know. Um, But let, let me deal with your question, because I, I know it's, 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 a, it's a sincerely put question, and a good one. It's really hard for me to comment on what you're doing, because I don't know all the things that you have done, okay? But I think, first of all, before somebody can get recognition, one has to be sure that you have in place your program, that it has been defined, and there is a comprehensive plan projecting on a one-year, a five-year, and a 15-year basis, for example. The biggest problem that students have, that we have on college campuses, I mean, any student really, is continuity, because you're only there for four years. And, you know, so what happens? So there needs to be, I, I would recommend, uh, in place a system for guaranteeing maximum feasible continuity of program and approach. So, for example, if one elects a president, maybe at the same time, maybe a president-elect ought to be elected. Somebody already designated to do the understudy to the president. So when that person moves out, the other one automatically moves in. Um, so what does one stand for? The agenda should be written down and defined. It should be, by the way, not too complex. There is great power in selling a, an easily understood, fairly simple message. You can understand three points better than you can understand 20 points, or remember three better than you can remember 20. And that's what we're doing. We're trying to sell our program. If you have something to say, and to say it nationally, you need to orchestrate that the right way. And I think that would, um, I'd have to rely on your judgment on the best way to approach getting that message across. But the worst thing in the world would be to get national attention focused on a group. And this I in no way imply, I in no way imply that this would be this group but I'm responding to your question in general. If a group wants national attention and gets it and then does not know what to say, <laughs> they won't ever get it again. It will almost be a step backward rather than a step forward. If your agenda is primarily internal, in other words, influencing how the universities involved here react to and with the black students on the campus, if you do that job well, national attention will come, probably almost automatically. But first of all, you have to do the analysis. What are the facts? What are, what are the problems? And then define ways to solve them. For example, how much money do these eight universities spend? Is it more than eight? Eight. How much money do they spend 
in buying light bulbs, pencils, and paper each year. And from whom do they buy those things? Have they ever bought them from a black supplier? In building all the buildings on campus, have they ever used a black architect, a black engineer, a black contractor? In the towns where these universities reside, and where, therefore, the towns are greatly influenced by the universities. Have the towns ever been asked by the universities to adopt a policy of affirmative action? If you start with looking at how the dollars flow in the universities themselves, we're talking about probably hundreds of millions of dollars. Who has the job? And I mean from waiting tables up to president. So there is a lot for us to do. But I'm just at, a, at an incapacity. I cannot advise you. The other thing is, I'm sure that you know what to do. It is, however, a matter of sitting down and grappling with it, deciding. And the worst thing in the world is, is to just commiserate with the problem so long that nothing gets done. Have a process for decision making. Make a decision and move. Even if one makes a mistake, as long as well intended and not harmful to somebody, it's better to be moving and moving imperfectly than just sitting like a bump on a log. It's been my observation in several places where I've been. Well, I think we've had a long night. I appreciate your inviting me. It's a great honor for me and I urge you to come to Atlanta. Thank you.